You guys have been to Columbus quite a few times over the years. Always at the same venue, I've noticed. Yeah, I mean, is there another is there another venue you think we should be trying out? No, no, no. It's just like you've been the same amount of popularity. I think that's kind of oh, cool. Oh, I get what you're saying. How does it feel to be coming back to Columbus if there's any? It's exciting that we we still exist in Columbus. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's pretty unusual and, and amazing. Every three years or so, you know, we play shows, maybe sort of festival shows, and it's like all the people there are like not there three years later you know it's, mm -hmm. and so we're just we're just grateful to you know ha have a job and it seems like other people believe in what we do as much as we do absolutely i know you guys have always kind of been self-produced from the time you started out up until now are there any producers that have particularly influenced the way you do things or has it kind of been just going at it and making the music you want to make initially it was a reactionary thing against production values at the time when we first started out. I particularly was repulsed by a lot of the sort of big, sort of grandiose um, production values in the early 90s when we first we made our first record. And so I sort of intentionally set out to make us sound small instead of big. And one reviewer even like ridiculed us for like having dinky beats i think is what he said and for me i was like yes exactly that's what's actually more subversive in the context of the united states of america than than giant powerful slabs of guitar and obviously you you use some instruments that aren't typically used uh the vibra slap in particular what uh inspired you to start using that in 70s cop shows like when I was when I was a kid and um as the band was forming I think actually I was listening to some Latin music particularly like Perez Prado and Argentinian like tango music and stuff and those are there's a lot more emphasis on percussion than just a big sounding drum kit that you find in in American rock and I I'm guessing Piero Umiliani was a big influence for you and that's why you did Manamana. Yeah, I mean, it was mostly about the song, but I love that version of it. I mean, that's the best version, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and another interview that I was listening to, like an earlier one, you were talking about the short skirt, long jacket video. One of many kind of crazy ideas you guys had for videos that the label maybe didn't like. Do you have, do you remember any of the other video ideas? Well, the video ideas that we had were mostly the video ideas that we didn't want to do like you gotcha. know what I mean and, which usually at that time were like had to do with a band posing in an urban decay setting you know with their instruments and lip syncing or making a really expensive video with lots of if you know video effects and I don't know we just didn't feel like it we just weren't in the mood for that and I think I had just watched a, there was like a sunglasses commercial. I think they were like on Venice Beach and making people put these glasses on and like describe how, how things look. And I just thought that would be good if we can get people to put headphones on and describe like either how much they hate it. We were hoping for like, you know, some negative because otherwise it would have been really weird. And we got that. It was all really sincere. People's critiques and people's praise alike. Yeah, I think... Hearing men on the street talk about music is very interesting in the first place because you don't you don't hear other people's opinions. You kind of tend to get in your own yeah. circle. So you guys now have your own label. Have you considered doing like re-recording any of your early albums so you have more ownership of them, or is that something completely? When I'm in a really bad mood, I do consider that. I don't know if I have enough time to record all the new songs that I've written. I and before I pass away, that's where I. I hesitate. Um, there are a couple songs that I think I think I'd like to re-record because I think we could have we could have done a, a little better with the arrangement or the production values, and that's that's like, I think I'm more tempted by that than re-recording an entire album. As a music listener, I'm a little put off by there being too, you know that many versions of a song. Um, usually, the version that I like the best is the first one that I heard. So I think that it's a little fraught for me, like thinking that we'd put a lot of work into a, another version and then it, people would still like, you You kind of fall in love with the, the, with the thing that you just, that you first heard. At least that's my experience, my personal experience. I feel the same way. Like I want to support the artist and listen to the 
what's going to make them yeah. more money for themselves. But I'm like, oh, you just got it right the first time. Um, yeah, just- I was advised, like I had this really nice uh, person from the dead Kennedys early on was giving me business advice as we were negotiating our first licensing deal. And he said, whatever you do, don't give them the rights to this album that you recorded on your own. And they really fought me for it. And I just said, no. So we retained the rights to our very first album. So that's good. I mean, that's very smart. Most people don't <laughs> don't get that kind of advice early on. Yeah. So thank you, East Bay Ray from the Dead Kennedys. And one more thing, though, will be, I think, more useful for artists right now as the value of our work descends literally, like, just precipitously into the toilet. There are two things. We need to aggregate our negotiational power. So lobby Congress to give us the right to collectively bargain against giant music distributors. Currently, we don't have the right to like a hundred of us all get together and say, hey, you know what? We want 0.0004 of a penny instead. So that's that's fucked that we don't have the right to, to do that. So of course, it's never going to get better until we have that I think fundamental right. And then number two, what I think is even would, would be even more fun would be for us to set up a giant nonprofit music distribution streaming platform, uh, maybe a co-op. I think the cooperative model is really cool. Every owner of a cooperative gets one vote. There's no top heavy like Nordic billionaire that everyone has to support. That's that. I just want to get that in there. But I don't think anybody's interested in that other than musicians. I, I was actually going to ask you about like what a musician's union would look like. What do you suppose like a musician's strike would look like? Yeah, well, there is a musician's union, but they just are conflicted. And unfortunately, their existence makes it really difficult for a real music union to emerge. I'm not sure exactly what the solution is. I think there's got to be a 21st century like version of a union that we can somehow put together i kind of think you know there might be some sort of way that we could work with some of the technology that we have now the sort of a virtual union wherein people could have an, like an app on their phone you know press a, re- a big red stop sign button if they're against it and in the back of a van when you're on the on tour i think that's been one of the big problems for for artists trying to like having any kind of collective powers that we're all sort of circling the globe and um, there needs to be there needs to be some sort of like central focus for us. I was a little nervous to ask about new music because I know you guys have been working on stuff, but like for the last few years. I know, right? It's, it's embarrassing. I have a ton of new songs and uh, and but I'm really perfectionistic about finding the right arrangements for them. You know, that, that means writing bass lines and trumpet parts and whatever else and so it's a lot of labor but it's actually labor that i'm doing in earnest and so it will happen it's just a matter of when i really feel ready and since we're not you know being told what to do by a label anymore we we get to take as long as we want and so maybe that's bad for the consumer i think it's gonna be good for the consumer because it'll be a better album and i'm sure your fans are gonna wait for it yeah i mean hopefully not too many of them die of covid in the meantime (laughs) One last question about Columbus, I guess. Are there any like places you've really enjoyed coming to or maybe ones in the beginning days you came to that? I wish I had a, a better answer for that than I do. But my answer is this, and it's maybe a good eye opener, a misconception about what it's like to tour. Generally, like every day that you're on tour, you're you're paying a lot of people. You're going into the red. Really, you're just sinking every day. And so you're just scrambling to get your head above the the, the mud or whatever. Usually you, you arrive to the city after like maybe eight hours in, in a van and your body feels like it's been pretzeled into something that it can never get out of. And, you know, you're kind of dumped into the back parking lot of the venue. And then you have this choice of whether you want to eat dinner or whether you want to take a nap. Generally, that hour and a half before a show, you're sort of in energy conservation mode. You really want to sort of focus. And um, so I usually choose the nap. (laughs) Can't blame you. Over food or tourism. It's okay. I'd take the nap too. (laughs) Had you you, um, interviewed 
um, Vincent Dufiore, our trumpet player, he would have told you which ping pong hall would was the best one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he, he would have been a better person to interview. For that particular topic. Right. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and I'm excited for the show Friday here in Columbus at Kimba Live. Thank you so much for your time. Take care.